Jonathan will be speaking about his book or some of this, the themes behind the book, you know, the Green Deal, uh, Global Climate Jobs. But more than that, he'll be talking, and I know that there's people from England um, and other places on the, the call, but we uh, have got COP26 and we would like to talk about how we can utilise that um, uh, as quickly as possible in partnership with a whole range of other people and campaigns that are around at the present moment uh, and will make an impact uh, in November, uh, either online or in, in our presence on the streets and in the meeting rooms and uh, elsewhere. But um, so we will be talking um, around how we would get 100,000 jobs in Scotland. And also, a lot of people are not really talking about the oil and gas industry. And I do think that that's um, an important area. And we have people here with quite good um, knowledge uh, and having worked, Neil and others worked in that industry. So I will invite them to, to come in and impart with their knowledge and their awareness of what, what is actually happening at the present moment. I just done that and Neil sat up pretty, pretty prompt. Uh, not yet, Neil, but uh, you will get your, your, your opportunity. So really, in a sense, the book, uh, which I'm uh, making my way through, it's a big, thick book. Normally we say that books are weapons, but that's so we can throw them at the other side. Um, but it does cover a great deal and it will be a handbook that we'll all refer to um, when, we're, when we're arguing uh, our arguments uh, around, around the campaigning that we should do. So really what I want to do now is to invite uh, Jonathan. But before, Jonathan, go ahead and uh, say your bit. Okay, um, I'm going to start, most of this talk will be about not Scotland, but about the world, um, because uh, that's what I wrote the book about, <laughs> and I'll come to why it's about the world when I get partway in, but I first want to start with the situation, the political situation we find ourselves in right now that makes what happens in Scotland at the COP very important, the global situation. And there's several bits to the background. First of all, um, the levels of carbon dioxide in the air are increasing very quickly. The difference between an, uh, an ice age and a normal warm period of the kind that we had in 1800, that difference is 100 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the air. Now, since 1800, we've had an increase of 137 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the air. So the difference between now and 1800 is more than the difference between an ice age with much of the world covered with glaciers and the situation we have now. It's been changing very fast. But if you put it that way, you're concealing that half of the change has happened since 1985. And a quarter of the change has happened since 2005. The speed is speeding up all the time. We're putting more and more carbon dioxide in the air each year. Um, and we're doing that. That period coincides with the time of peak climate bullshit. It coincides with the time when the leaders of the world have all been telling us that it's terribly important and we have to do everything and the market will solve it and we are doing everything and we have a projected plan and we have a promise and so on and so on. The louder the promises are getting, the higher the levels of carbon dioxide are growing. That's the first thing. The second thing is we've been waiting a long time for the market to have effect, to move us over to renewable energy. On a global scale now, globally investment in renewable and in the main forms of renewable energy that will power the future, wind power and solar power, investment globally in those started to decline in 2016 and is continuing to decline. On a global level, the amount of ener global energy that comes from wind and solar is 2%. 
And on a European level, it's only 4%. Scotland is very, very good comparatively. 14% of energy in Scotland comes from renewables. And you may think it's more because 40% of electricity comes from renewables, but most of the burning of fossil fuels in the world and in Scotland is not for uh, electricity. Most of it is for transport, for heating, heating buildings and homes and for, um, uh, for industry. Okay, so that's the first thing. We're in trouble. Renewables are not solving it. The levels of uh, carbon dioxide in the air are going up and up. Then we get the COVID epidemic. And the COVID pandemic globally has been an, a learning experience, which is very, very important for what's going to happen, uh, for people's attitudes towards uh, climate change. Because we've learned several things from COVID. First of all, we've learned if the scientists tell you that something very bad is going to happen unless you act, pay attention and act. The second thing is act immediately. The difference in one week in the lockdown in, in Britain the first time round was a difference of 30,000 dead. The difference of one week for when the lockdown happened. So do, do it, do it fast immediately and do everything they say. With COVID, it's not one thing or this thing or that thing or masks or testing or whatever, or vaccination, it's doing all of them. And we've also learned that this is a global problem that, uh, that we have to solve globally, but the political fight about dealing with COVID happens country by country. And it's exactly the same with climate change. We can't solve it until we solve it globally, but the political fight about solving it happens country by country. We've learned that when the public sector does it, it works. And when the private sector does it, it doesn't work. And that's, so we have all of those learning things from COVID, but we have another consequence of COVID, which is a global economic depression. Worse some places than in other places, not simply called, caused by COVID. The world economy was on course to go down into a recession anyway. That has been exacerbated by COVID, but that underlying problem is still there. And we will have mass unemployment in a good deal of the world. Some countries for the next 18 months, some for two years or three years or four years. Um, so a massive economic crisis at the heart of which is people need jobs. But also what we've learned in COVID and what we're seeing now is when governments need to spend the money, they can spend the money and they can spend enormous amounts of money. And in much of the world now, austerity is over. In two and a, the United States was in the Second World War for just over two and a half years. In those two and a half years, military expenditure in the United States in today's dollars was $4 trillion. Since the beginning of the pandemic in the United States, government spending on subsidies because of the pandemic, the COVID pandemic in the last 14 month, 13 months in the United States have been $5.4 trillion. That's more than they spend on the whole of the Second World War. And that's adjusted for inflation. But the Biden subsidy package passed this, passed this week was for $1.9 trillion, one half of the total expenditure on, milita on American military in the Second World War, uh, an order of magnitude more than Franklin Delano Roosevelt spent on the, on the New Deal in his first year in office. There is no question that Governments can come up with the money. Not in every country. There are still um, uh, there are still important pocket. It's still important parts of austerity politics left, particularly in the punishment of the global south. But globally, um, globally, governments can and do come up with the money. And the debate that is going on globally now is: what will that money be spent on? Will it be spent on rescuing the corporations, rescuing the rich? 
or will it be spent on the needs of ordinary human beings and ordinary workers and farmers and of stopping climate change and saving the planet? That's the debate. We have two important strengths in this debate that we did not have three years ago. The first one, we done that four years ago. The first one is, well, there's several actually. One is people know now. The level of, of natural disasters caused by climate change is rising all the time. That's one reason people know about climate change. But the other reason is every bit of the media and many, many conversations you have, people are saying it to each other over and over again, this is climate change. This, the environmental movement has achieved that. We've changed that conversation and we've changed it globally. The second thing that's happened though, is that we had the massive student strikes globally, concentrated in Europe, much smaller outside of Europe and Australia, but still a climate movement on a scale we had not seen before. And absolutely crucial was the tactic. The tactic was strike. Thunberg says over and over again, strike, strike, climate strike, climate strike. Strikes not just of people in general, but strikes organized by school, by school, by school. Uh, this, the climate strike movement called for a global general strike last October. That happened to a large extent in Australia and in Germany and nowhere else in the world, but they called for it. This is a new weapon and it's a movement of a new generation. The people under 18 are far more radical than the people of 18 to 30. It's a new gener on almost every issue that can be pulled on. It's a new generation moving on to the stage of history. It's the future. The second thing though, is that we have the idea of the Green New Deal. The reason we have the idea of the Green New Deal is that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez went to Standing Rock, went to uh, a, a mass picket and occupation against a pipeline on indigenous lands in the United States, organized by in indigenous environmentalists and connected to the movement against fracking and the movement against oil and the movement for climate change. She went to that and she decided that she was going, as did that experience, that she was gonna run, uh, run for Congress. When she won her first day in office, there was a sit-in in the office of the leader of her party, Nancy Pelosi, by 200 young people demanding climate jobs. So she went to that, she went to that sit-in and she came away and wrote a bill for a Green New Deal. So now the world has the idea that a Green New Deal is possible. There's two parts to a Green New Deal. I'm gonna talk almost all about the climate part, but one of the geniuses of what Ocasio-Cortez did was she said that we want a new deal of jobs to save, the, to stop climate breakdown, to save the planet, but we also want massive government spending on the other things that human beings need. That's the New Deal part of the Green New Deal. In the United States, that's above all else, a national healthcare system. Here, it would be, uh, I think, above all else, jobs in care and jobs rescuing people, workers who, who are losing their jobs. But I'm gonna concentrate on the climate jobs part of it. Um, okay. Now, in this situation, so what we're entering into is a period when it is possible to say, we want a Green New Deal, we want climate jobs, we want them now to save the planet, but also because we have massive numbers of people out of work. Now, the, where should that money go? What should it be spent on? An enormous amount of my book is devoted to the endless technicalities of that issue because the technicalities matter. But the overwhelming principle is you can't stop climate change without doing an enormous amount of human work. And because everything that's powered by fossil fuels has to now be powered in a different way. And that requires an enormous amount of work. First of all, building enough renewable electricity uh, enough renewable energy so that we can cover all the electricity needs that we currently have. Then building enough more renewable energy 
that will make electricity so that we can cover all of ground transport, trucks and cars and buses and everything else. And then building enough renewable energy that we can heat all the houses and all the buildings with renewable electricity and then building enough renewable energy for renewable electricity that we can power all of the industrial processes. And then building an enormous super grids, very sophisticated, technically complex things covering very large areas so that we can, um, uh, uh, so that we can connect all of those needs for electricity. So three, but in different countries between three and four and five times as much electricity as we have now needs to be built. It needs to be built quickly. Along with that though, we need some regulations. First of all, regulations that no ground transport will be run on electricity after a certain date. We stop selling, uh, sorry, it will be run by fossil fuels, run by gas. We, start sell, we stop selling um, uh, petrol vehicles and we only sell electric vehicles from say three years from now. So we phase out all of that kind of transport by rules. The second important thing is building codes. Building codes that say that every single building that's built must be built to passive house standards. To in, so it uses 10% of the energy for heating that houses, uh, that houses use currently. Um, thirdly, industrial regulation that say above all else that we stop using uh, cement for almost every purpose that we use cement now, we stop using cement for technical reasons. There's an enormous amount of emissions that uh, come from cement. And critically, we want to move in 15 to 20 years to a situation where renewable energy is not in competition with fossil fuels, where the sale and production of fossil fuels becomes illegal in the way that anthrax, the sale and production of anthrax, is now illegal. So we need regulations, not simply a market. And we need massive government intervention. There is no way. The arguments are surprisingly technical and surprisingly detailed, but there is no way, as I argue all the way through the book, there's no way that this is going to be delivered by the governments. Massive government programs have to, have to deliver it. Okay. Okay, there will be, I go through in some detail, there are stubborn sections where it's difficult to think how to um, decarbonize. We can ban all uh, airline flights of less than, um, than 2,000 miles, um, but we've still got difficulty, we've still got difficulty getting from eight, we can get from eight, we can get from Moscow to Cape Town on the train, <laughs> but we've got difficulty getting from Moscow to Vancouver on a train for technical reasons. There, there are stubborn places. There are stubborn problems with, uh, with meat consumption, although we can have the emissions from meat, meat uh, by at least there's stubborn problems with rice. There are these various small areas of stubbornness, but basically we can cut emissions globally by close to 90%, which is what we have to do. So that's one set of arguments. And in the book, I come back, um, come back again and again to the details of the arguments that consume the climate movement, consume the environmental movement about what can we do about batteries and what can we do about nuclear power and so on. And I'll come back to these if you want, but what joins all of these arguments together, I realized after I'd sort of swatted about 40 of them in writing the book, all of them are about, do we have to cut carbon dioxide emissions. All of them are arguments that say, we can't cut carbon dioxide emissions because we can't electrify all vehicles, or we don't have to do it because we can do it by planting trees, or um, there are enormous number, we can do it by carbon capture and storage. There, there are an enormous number of these and they all boil down to, we don't have to change from fossil fuels to wind and solar. That's what they boil down to. Um, and, You'll be familiar with those kinds of arguments because one another thing that we have learned in the COVID epidemic is that the, the arguments take place about what is to be done politically, the arguments for zero COVID and the movement you have, 
they take place in what seem to be technical arguments <laughs> about do you need isolation with track and trace? Uh, do we need to, uh, uh, can we run a small level and so on? That, and the political arguments over, over climate change take place, it seems, in the form of a series of technical arguments. So part of what I'm doing, uh, Willie did say that it, you know, it's a big book, and I hadn't told you, Willie, there's going to be a test after this meeting. <laughs> um, but um, the, 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 there's a reason I make all those kinds of arguments. I want to finish with two things, though. One is an argument I make that's not directly about Scotland, but is about humanity, and it's this. There was a time when, um, oh, there was a time 15 years ago, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, it was pretty easy to say that the problem of stopping climate change, of stopping emissions, was basically a problem of cutting the emissions of the global north, of the rich countries. Um, in 2019, 62% of global emissions came from the poor countries. In um, pretty soon, it's, it's rising all the time, pretty soon it's going to be two thirds. Rising standards of living in China, in India, and in much of the world, and rising industrialization are at the heart of this. And what this means is that it is going to be absolutely impossible mathematically impossible to cut global emissions by 90% unless there are deep cuts in two thirds of the total emissions and what's coming from the global south. Now that is deeply, deeply, deeply unfair because the countries of the global emission, many countries in the global south have higher emissions per person than China has higher emissions per person than Scotland. But they don't have, they have relatively much lower incomes in places like India and Bangladesh, very much lower incomes. They did not create the international economic order that has bought us this. They did not create the enormous emissions that have already happened. It's deeply unfair to penalize the poor more. It is deeply unfair. How do we get around this? What I argue at a great deal of length is the only way around is if we in the climate movement say that what we want for the global south, for 80% of humanity who live in the global south, what we want is a path to development, a path to the Western life expectancy, a path to Western industrialization, a path to that that relies entirely on renewable energy. That because if we say, if the climate movement tries to say to people in the global south, you have to hold back. You cannot have our standard of living. We will not allow it because the planet cannot afford it. If we say that, then they will pay no attention. And we are up, in order to do something about this, we are up against all the great powers of the world. We have to, what we've learned is that they, as, as Thunberg keeps saying, they, all of them, all of them haven't done what needs to be done. Um, all of the world leaders, that's the power up against. So we have to mobilize the majority of humanity. Jonathan. Yes. Can I just say that it's five minutes? To, okay, to, that's to great. Okay. So Thank we. You. Um, we have to mobilize the majority of humanity. Um, and to do that, we need the support of workers and small farmers and retired people in China and India and Bangladesh and Brazil. And unless, unless they have the possibility of making poverty history, we will not get that support. So I talk all the way through about the necessity of, of cutting emissions uh, north and south and in the poorest countries, just limiting emissions to what they are now, but still allowing people to escape from poverty. Okay, I wanna end with two things. One is to say a crucial thing we have to say, and this is obvious with North Sea oil and very important, is if it's a government climate jobs program, 
then that government can promise everybody who loses a job in the old big carbon economy, everybody in the oil and gas industry um, in Scotland, North Sea, every one of those people, a permanent, well-paid, secure job. If it's not a government job, we can't do that. The last, <sighs> Willie, I've got about five minutes to say on how this relates to the cop. My instinct is to just finish here with something else and come back to that in about half an hour. Does that seem right? Yeah, that's that's great. You can okay. you can come in when okay. you when you, okay. Just put your then hand let up. Let me just be, let me finish on what mm. this means. What it the reason that we have to act. Um, and I trace this out in a good deal of detail in the book. The reason that we have to act is if we don't, we're not facing the end of humanity. We're not facing the collapse of all civilization, but we're facing something on the level of 500 million or a billion dead. Something on the level 10 or 20 times of the carnage of the Second World War. And we're, what's worse that we're facing is what the people who have to live through that time will have to see and witness and what they will have to do to survive in that time and to follow orders. And I think particularly about my grandchildren, I have five. I'm not so worried about what how my grandchildren are going to suffer, although I am, you know, they might something they might die. What I'm more worried about is what they'll have to do, what they will have to become, what humanity will have to become in order to deal with that sort of situation, in order to deal with a situation in which the world has become what Darfur has recently been, what Syria is now. That's what we want to avoid. And this is the last point. We can avoid it because we've learned the promises about what they'll do in 20, 30 years are lies. Declarations of climate emergencies are lies. Scenarios are lies. Everything that they've told us hasn't been happening. But if we say to the government, you got to spend this much money, you got to have 100,000 jobs in Scotland to decarbonize Scotland, in 20 years, and Scotland hires 100,000 people to do those, start doing those jobs next year, then right now you've started to solve the problem. In 20 years, you've solved the problem, and you've got 100,000 people and all of their relatives and mates and friends who are going to fight to keep those jobs there. That's the point of what, we're, what we can do. A space is opening up for a time in global politics where we can make this argument and people will hear. The money is there. They are already spending the money. This is what we need to spend the money on. And that way, we avoid hell. I'll stop there. Okay. Um, again, I'm not going to cover everything. Um, I agree with almost all of what Bob said. I agree with Matthew. I agree um, with Donnie. I agree with Mike. I agree with a very great deal of what's been said. I want to concentrate on that question that Vicky asked and that other people have been asking in different ways. Who is going to do this? And I think there's more than one answer. One absolutely central answer is working class people. Working class people, however, are not exactly the same thing as the trade union movement we have now. They're not the same thing as the trade union leaders we have now, but crucially, they're a very, very much larger number of people <laughs> that are in the trade union movement. Globally, they're a very much larger number of people. I mean, my, my daughter was a white van woman for eight years. My stepson is a white van man, neither of them had a union. Do you know what I mean? As, you know, as um, Meghan Markle said, I had a union in my last job and they could protect me. But an awful lot of people in different jobs do not now have a union. 
And so building unions is part of it. It's also very important in climate politics that you're not necessarily, I find that when we try and get the whole union structure together in any country in the world, then the representative each union go for the lowest common denominator and what we can ask for and we end up deciding in, that coal mining is a green job. This is a, a thing that happens again and again. What we want is part of the trade union movement and that part of the trade union movement can bring over the rest of the people. So absolutely working class people are central because we are concentrated in the big cities of the world where the decisive battles of power have been fought for the last 50 years, but also because we're very close, we are at about half of the working population of the world. But also very important, I go into it in the book, very important to the small farmers of the world, particularly the people whose lives are now being devastated and will be devastated by climate change. The single most electric meeting I've ever done on climate was in Durban with a bunch of people who came in in a rented bus from the countryside in an area where they had been resisting an Australian mining company, opening up a mine in their area, but they had had a drought for three years. And I explained to them what was causing that drought and what they had, what they had to do. And the room was quiet all the way through. And then they made me repeat the meeting word for word a second time so that they could think about that. What I learned from that, we will we, if the climate movement does it right, we will have enormous movements on the street of people who are suffering from climate change, who demand that they be rescued, that they have help, agricultural wisdom help and seeds and so on, but that they have money when they cannot grow food because they have no um, water and that they be allowed to move to other countries and get through the immigration controls when their livelihoods are be destroyed and that something be done about climate change globally. That is going to be a very important part of our movement, a very angry and very large part if we build it right. I go through lots of other things. How do we get people who are fighting um, extractivist lithium mines? How do we recruit them? How do we get all of these different groups of people in because we're gonna to have to get an enormous number of people. But if you look around, I think you can see now, it's a two-sided thing if you look around the world. What you, what you saw four years ago, five years ago, almost everywhere in the world except parts of the Middle East was a very, everywhere I went and talked to meetings, quite demoralized people. Now, if you look around the world, um, the, um, Today I saw a video of um, 300 um, women workers in a textile factory in Myanmar singing a song to bring out all of the workers in their textile factory to join the open-ended general strike to remove the military coup. After that, I saw a video of another group of textile workers going to another textile factory and singing to them a non-union textile factory to bring them out. If you look around the world at the scale of the uprisings, usually with the support of a large majority of the population, um, in Myanmar, in Iraq, in the last three years, in Sudan, in Myanmar, in Iraq, in Mali, in Guinea, in Senegal, in, uh, in Chile, in Hong Kong, in Thailand, um, uh, Myanmar, and the enormous farmers upsurge in India at the moment. What you see is movements that reject, and Belarus, movements that have enormous public support, that are overwhelmingly working class, that are in which women, <laughs> in most cases, women are the leadership on the ground and often the national leadership as well, in which the feminist movement is engaged in order to change the world. Lebanon as well, very good example of that. Uh, Morocco, Algeria, these are enormous movements. This is something entirely new. These are upsurges. They're, uh, now finish with this. These are upsurges that are being made in a world where we are living in the ruins of the failure 
of the anti-colonial independence, what came after colonial independence, the failure of that great movement, the failure of the great communist movement that aimed to change the world and then ended in the government of China, and the long grinding failure of social democracy, the great hopes of humanity in the uh, 20th century, these enormous movements, people have given up faith in those movements. And in Lebanon, the demonstrators chout, ch chant, all of them means all of them, by which they mean that they reject, reject all of the existing politicians and political parties, and they are majority agreed on that. And yet, they're not sure how to go in these countries. They're sure about democracy, very sure about democracy. Beyond that, they want much more than democracy. They're not sure about how to get it. They're not sure yet even what the dream is because of the death of the old dreams, but that we have to have a dream. This is becoming quite generally accepted in the world. People are moving in a way and on a scale that they have not moved in my lifetime, and I'm not young. Um, that is going to be spreading. We're entering into a period in which that spreads and grows. And the question is, what does that movement, all of us, an enormously bigger movement than us, what are those people for? And the crucial issue of this generation, of the next 20 years and the next 40 years, everybody knows this, the central issue is what do we do about climate change? And that means we have to dare. We have to to dare in the social democracy, dare the people who built anti-apartheid and colonial independence. We have to dare in the way that those people dared. And that's difficult for those of us who have been through a long period of defeat. It's difficult in Britain at the moment, which is just for the moment a terribly backward country. But it is, if you look around the world, this is how it's changing. And the school students are that thing again. They're the people who trust none of the established politicians. They're overwhelmingly young. If you look on the ground, they're mainly led by young women and so on, um, but young men included as well. That's, that's the possibility of the future. We have, I have many people my age or even in your fifties or your forties, we have been ground down by shit for decades <laughs> and we've been beaten down by it but look up and look around and you can see a new world coming and you can see absolutely central problem that humanity has to solve if we are going to preserve our species and the other species on earth so dare as Danton said at the beginning of the French Revolution dare 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 <laughs>